Hello, and welcome back to our conversations with Isaiah. I am the Reverend Nancy Springer, and I'm here with my friend and colleague, the Reverend David Matthews, and we are continuing through this lengthy walk with Isaiah, um, walking through all of it. We are in what is designated as chapter 45, um, and we're going to break this chapter up um, into smaller bits, even though it is one coherent thought. So we invite you to look for the next two videos to make um, this one whole. Um, again, think of it as you watch TV. You got to wait for next week for the next thing. Um, but we're so grateful you are here. We are reading from the Common English Bible, but we um, ask you to just follow along with us and join us with whatever translation you have accessible to you. David, you want to start us off reading? Thanks, Nancy. Isaiah 45, verse 1. The Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whom I have grasped by the strong hand, to conquer nations before him, disarming kings and opening doors before him, so no gates will be shut. I myself will go before you, and I will level mountains. I will shatter bronze doors. I will cut through iron bars. I will give you hidden treasures of secret riches, so you will know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I called you by name. I gave you an honored title, though you didn't know me. I am the Lord, and there is none other. Besides me, there is no God. I strengthen you, though you don't know me. So all will know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is nothing apart from me. I am the Lord, there is no other. I form light and create darkness, make prosperity and create doom. I am the Lord who does all these things. Pour down you heavens above and let the clouds flow with righteousness. Let the earth open for salvation to bear fruit. Let righteousness sprout as well. I, the Lord, have created these things. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So David, what do you see in this short section as the key verse that gets us gets our conversation going? Uh, to me, it's verse five. Uh, I read, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I strengthen you, though you don't know me. And I think this verse is key, not just for our reading right now, but actually for this entire chapter. It, it emphasizes what the point is that's being made. And right away, uh, it says, I am the Lord, there is no other besides me, there is no God. And he is, this is still the conversation or the talk uh, in reference to Cyrus. Now, historically, we know Cyrus is the king of Persia, although here it doesn't actually emphasize again that Cyrus is the king of Persia. It doesn't actually emphasize who Cyrus is. I don't know about you, Nancy, but when I was growing up, I was in a classroom and there were a few people named David. I was not the only David. So <laughs> there are there are a few, um, you know, thoughts as to who Cyrus is. This is, you know, we historically looking back in scripture think this is referencing the king of Persia. Um, but again, this might not. It might have referenced somebody else or, but the king of Persia, we recognize also did a number of really great things for the people of Israel. So we tend to lean towards that interpretation. So I am the Lord, there is no other besides me, there's no God. Again, no one else. I strengthen you though you don't know me. It references the relationship that Cyrus will have with God, that Cyrus won't know the God of Israel, won't know who he is. So that sort of falls in line with the idea or interpretation that this is somebody who's a foreigner. But equally, God will show them his favor, will hold them up. And the amazing thing is, God's action, it shows in this verse, is independent of our action, independent of our beliefs or thoughts. And I'm always hesitant to have one verse sort of shade our entire view of the Bible, but I do think that this verse falls in line with the rest of my view of the Bible already, which is that God does act, and his action is often independent of my beliefs or thoughts. He's actually the initiator of things, mm -hmm. not just the responder. Um, so here, though you don't know me, God will strengthen him. 
And that's, uh, I think, a very profound verse. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And everything, the verses up to that lead to that main point, right? So we have this anointed person, right? The same wordings, the same words that will be used to describe the Messiah that is promised and to come, um, the anointed one. Um, and God has taken him by the hand, right? And led him in. Um, shattering doors and cutting down the bars that try to block God's way. Um, there is nothing that can stop God from doing what it is God intends to do. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, God chooses to work through humans. That's um, part of God's human project. And we see that through scripture. But when the humans, God tasks with certain things, don't get it done, that doesn't stop God from getting it done. Right? Our, um, our failings do not cause God to fail. Absolutely. So all of this. What is it? C.S. Lewis said something far more cleverly than how I'm going to put it, but um, right, God's glory is not diminished simply because you do not believe it. Absolutely. And Nancy, we see uh, just in verses seven and eight, the, this... Um, uh, I don't know what would the I can't remember the actual technical term for it, but the verse is sort of uh, contrasting from from opposite views. Verse seven: I form light and create darkness, make prosperity, create doom. I am the Lord who does all these things, right? And it's recognizing this power of God, and it's flushing out that idea of though you don't know me. So he's saying, this is this is almost. Uh, this point is almost picked up again by Paul in the beginning of the book of Romans uh, that says uh, God's divine power and eternal late nature have been clearly understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. And Paul there is referencing the idea that all people are responsible to the call and to the law of God, even though they don't know it, because God has always been able to be seen, at least by his his creation, his, his raw elemental power. Um, and so here, this verse is, is, is in that same vein, that same idea. He's God saying, I'm the one who did all these things that you do know. Um, and then the next verse, pour down you heavens above, let the clouds flow with righteousness, let the earth open for salvation to bear fruit, let righteousness sprout as well. I, the Lord, have created these things. So now he's sort of doing the, the flip side of that. So he's not just talking about the creation he's done, but the creation he's going to do. And so he's saying to Cyrus, this is what I have already done. And these are the things now I'm going to cause happen. And so that you know who I am and that I'm the one that these things are good because they come from my hand. And so that's something that's very... Uh, I think telling of, of God here trying to help this character Cyrus understand his identity, what he's all about and what he's done in the past. So that again is uh, this statement of, uh, I strengthen you though you don't know me. He's trying to help him to know him. Right, yeah, this is, um, this is that unknown God, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, you know, pointing back towards uh, Paul in later chapters mm -hmm. in the Temple of Athens, when you've got all these statues to different gods, there's the statue to the unknown God, and Paul points at it and says, you guys are obviously very religious people. Let me tell you about who this God is here. <laughs> and yeah. that's kind of what's happening here, is Cyrus obviously knows of other gods, other forces, but now God is saying, there is nobody who sits higher than I do, nobody who's more powerful than I am. I'm going to tell you about me. Yeah. And yeah. so he's, he's really then, doing what Paul does later. Right. Yeah. And the name is so powerful, right? Throughout um, the Old Testament, right? God gives people new names, right? Abram becomes Abraham. Sarai becomes Sarah. Um, Jacob becomes Israel, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so when God says, I call you by name to this person, right? He is saying, you are now my person, my chosen, mm -hmm. um, you belong with me. Um, and so, right. But that is, 
that, as you said, that is irrelevant, irrespective of whether that person knew God before this moment. Um, God has said, I will use this Cyrus to do um, what needs doing. Mm -hmm. And it's not by accident, of course, that uh, yeah. both kings and popes often change their name when they become their new title. And it's because they're really walking out this same idea of the revelation or the empowerment, the transformative um, act of God in this person in this moment, so that they have ceased to be the old and are now the new. And it's the same thing as God saying, I see you and I know your name. God saying, I know who you were created to be, who that, that, ki that king name or that pope name is supposed to be. I know that. And so God's not just hiding that and holding on to that, but is also, if you will, prom it, it's almost like a promise to the person as well that I am going to bring that to pass. I'm going to bring that out of you, bring, bring you into that person. Because the name is the beautiful identity. Like Jesus calls Peter the rock, but we know that Peter is a very bad Humble. rock. <laughs> <laughs> like Peter is a, let's be honest, like, and I, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to harp on Peter. Peter, and then that's the point is right. Peter himself, I'm sure later on in his life would look back at his earlier part and go, oh my goodness. Just like we wow. probably do of our younger selves. Um, and so Peter, by the end of his life, though, lived into that name, right? There he is going to death himself, and he is the rock in his faith. He's not forsaking it. He's holding on to it and, and proclaiming it. So the, the, the know, God knowing our name isn't just like a statement of God saying, I have power over you. It's the promise of God saying, I know the hope for you as well. And I'll bring you to that place. Right. And you are worthy and valuable to me. Yep. Um, but it has the saying go, right? Long before God created me, he factored my stupidity into his plan. <laughs> and there's great hope in those words, right? There is great hope in those words. Yes. And I'm there hoping he didn't just We can do to thwart God's plan. Yes. We cannot mess up that bad. Yes. And, and don't get me wrong, uh, I do believe in the idea that we can, if you will, make a right mess of it along the way, um, mm -hmm. but we can't yes, make a mess can. so much as God cannot redeem, um, but okay. I do believe that we do need to also have responsibility for our messes, uh, for our mistakes, and recognize Absolutely. the damage that they actually do cause. Adam and Eve, by their mistake, brought death into the world through their sin. I understand through my sin, I have done no less. I have brought death into the world and other people as well as myself have paid the consequences for those mistakes. And the ultimate person, the, the person who paid the ultimate price for that mistake, of course, is Jesus. So it is, it's a very heavy thought, but it's also very, uh, very, very redeeming thought as well, Nancy. Yes, my stupidity, although it does cost God and it does cost people my it doesn't ultimately separate me from him if i am willing to fall down on my knees right because god is the god of redemption and there's god will make right all things come together for good we are we are seeking god and doing our best and that's right that's what he's trying to set cyrus up for right is to say hey um i'm i'm going to work with you to do amazing things in this world um and you are you are mine and i and i love you and you are worthy and so that's that's the same message we all get right um and whether we receive that gift or not um doesn't diminish the power of the gift mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely um Nancy, what do you make yeah. of uh, when we come to verse seven, where it says, I form light and create darkness, make prosperity and create doom. What do we, what do we make of this idea that God creates darkness and creates doom? Well, if you, 
actually go back to the original creation story, right? It says nothing about God creating dark. Dark is a byproduct of light. <laughs> it was from the out of the darkness that God formed the light, um, and the darkness does not overcome the light. And I think part of that is is the humanness that is exposed in in our written scriptures, right? We need to credit somebody with the bad things in this world um, and darkness is in doom, right? We, we don't understand them. Um, and so I think we, in our limited humanness, we want to say um, God is responsible for that. And yet, as you said, right, it was Adam and Eve's failing that brought um, death into the world. It was our brokenness um, that did it, um, hmm. not God. And it's, it's interesting because in the, yeah, it says, I form light, right? And maybe this, this is probably a moment where, we, where it would do us well to search other versions and to look back into the original uh, Hebrew writings. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I don't want to spend the time doing that just now, but the yeah. important part to, to understand is even in this, even in this translation, it doesn't say that, that, uh, that the creating of the darkness, if you will, uh, in some way steps away from our scientific understanding of what darkness is, which is just the absence of light. So if God is forming light, then the absence or the process of that forming of that bringing together and creating means that that which is not the light is darkness. Um, and that's, that's just a, a, an interesting byproduct. And of course, for anybody who um, has, has you know, watched their friend or, or their sibling be given some money or an allowance, the first thing they do is sort of look in their pocketbook and wonder, how come I don't have anything? Or why don't I have as much or anything like that? And so there's this sense of by creating prosperity, you are also creating inequality. By creating prosperity, you are also creating um, a, a lack in some people of what they have. And so it, it, it's hard, this topic. And I don't, I don't believe there is any injustice in this statement of God's but it is, it is showing certainly the idea of God's bringing blessing to people and that the blessing comes from God. I don't think we should spend too much time believing or focusing that the darkness or the doom is meant to be purposely poured out by God's hand in, an, in a vindictive or, or yeah. evil manner. Um, I don't think it shows any malice of forethought of his personality. Um, does anything what we might consider bad to come from the hand of God. There's there, that is quite a theological arguments to be made, but mm -hmm. I, I think it would require more, more of a conversation than we have today. Right. Um, but I think you said it well, right? So when, right, God chooses a people group to bless with the caveat, and he says this over and over in his covenants and blessings, you are blessed so that you can bless others. Right. Um, but the people we are then supposed to go bless with what we've been given don't see that. And so it does appear unequal, unequal from their side of it, right? Um, and then in our humanness, we tend to hoard rather than share. And so we forget that we're supposed to go share our blessing with mm -hmm. those folks that um, may be jealous of our blessing. Yeah. And it, it's yeah, hard because yeah. a number of people in our own churches, of course, uh, that the Bible talks about tithing and giving uh, offerings. And so I, I have a hard enough time getting my congregation to or, or getting our people to realize that this idea of tithing is a command in the Bible by God. It's a responsibility they have uh, so much so that the book of Malachi says that those who don't tithe are thieves and that they are stealing from the temple. They're stealing from the, the, the courtroom of God. And so it does, it's a hard idea. But the reality is that our tithing and our gifts aren't supposed to stop at just 10%, but they're actually supposed to continue on through the process of then offerings on top of that. And there are people who are th have been throughout history that have tithed, a lot of people. Uh, you know, we, a number of very faithful Christians today do tithe properly. And then there are a few, but 
not as many, who then go well above and beyond that. And doesn't, don't stop at 10%, don't stop at 20, don't even stop at 30. But they give and they give and they give well, uh, well beyond just the 10% of what they are receiving. And so in that sense, they are truly, they have been blessed to be a blessing. And that is, that is, is what I think this is trying to call out and show that this is the purpose of why God gives, is to create people like that. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so Nancy, is there uh, is there anything else that you would want to highlight before we move on into the uh, next section with another with another edition? Um, I think that's all I have. Right as we as we step out of this conversation into the next one, um, with the idea of um, who God is as our Creator, right? and keeping that in mind. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. All right. So the, the last thing I would just like to say is, is to emphasize this point, because it'll be important for our ne next edition, is that it says, I am the Lord, there is no other besides me, there is no God, I strengthen you. And that's the act of God to create, to empower, to encourage, to build up. And that's important for the next uh, analogy that is going to be talked about, as well as how God continues on this conversation. So thanks for joining us this week. We're very glad to be able to continue to walk through the book of Isaiah with you and to talk about all those things that God is encouraging us to see along the way. And hopefully God's spoken to you through this as well. So God bless you and have a great day. Bye.